What's up? What's up, Satish? Look at you. All <laughs> ready to go. I love the masks behind you, man. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> That's my, uh, when I go on travels, instead of collecting shot glasses, I collect masks. <laughs> you mean you transitioned from collecting shot glasses to masks? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for making some time. Um, for those of us that are new to your world, do you want to do a minute intro into PCHS and the work you're doing there? Sure. So PCHS is People Centered Health Services. It's been around for 30 years. And uh, I talk about lifelong volunteer. We'll, we'll chat about that later. But um, I took on the role of PCHS Foundation CEO about a year and a half ago. And my role is to raise funds for four programs that do not receive any funding. Right. Um, there's mental health, addictions, domestic violence. And then we have a program for seniors called Longer on Wheels. So it's feeding seniors who have essentially been abandoned by their families. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. And every time I meet somebody who's in the space that you're in, where serving others is what you do for every day. You know, a lot of us get up and say, yeah, I'm going to go work at a bank. I'm going to go start a business or I'm going to where there's a me part, which is before the serve part. But what you get up and do every morning is make sure everybody else is good. And that is what your job is. Walk us through how you get to this, this, this opportunity, you know? So I, I started with PCHS when I was 17. And, uh, you know, as a teenager, didn't want to go down the wrong path. And I sort of just, you know, started volunteering. And uh, when PCHS Foundation started, uh, Buldev, who's my mentor, he actually said to me, listen, like I needed a career change. And he said, listen, you've been a lifelong volunteer with PCHS. You have the personality. It's about networking. I make friends with every, everyone everywhere I go. So it seemed like a natural transition. And, um, you know, I feel like organizations such as PCHS, there's a lot of ethno-specific organizations, um, but this one I wanted us to bre uh, branch out to mm. more mainstream companies like Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. I've, we partnered with them. We partnered with uh, Jumpstart Charities. So the list goes on, but I wanted other communities outside of the South Asian community to know the work that we're doing. Man. Uh, I'm already scribbling away. I'm like, as you're <laughs> typing or talking, I'm going, wait a second. Um, just to unpack that little statement, right? One of the things I, I always talk about is, especially with young folks, um, I don't know what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I want to be in life. And then I'm like, look, if you can't figure that out, which is normal, start paying attention to what people say you're good at. And there's a lot of truth in that. And you started off by saying, hey, well, Dave said you make friends easily and you walk into an environment and connect with humans right away. That's a great superpower. And at 17, did that resonate as, man, this is a superpower that I didn't learn in school, but I could turn it into something? You know what? At 17, it didn't. But, you know, a lot of the times, and I'm still struggling this with this at 44, is, you know, seeing your, yourself the way others see you. Mm. So at 17, I embraced that. And I said, okay, well, if he sees it, there's, there's something in me that I need to kind of start to own. Right. And, you know, I, my confidence just built working with him. He had me passing, I, I'm aging myself here, passing smoking bylaws for the city of Mississauga, where I stood up at City Hall and spoke to Hazel McCallion. Wow. And, and I was 18. <laughs> And I was like, she said to me, how old are you? I'm like, 18. She got up, came and shook my hand. And I said, wow, like, this is pretty powerful stuff I'm doing here. And right. just thought, okay, I'm reading this, you know, talking stats, etc. But yeah, so. What an incredible, what an incredible moment to anchor, right? And, and I think, you know, uh, I did something similar where I come from Singapore and the version I had in my head was this dumb kid that was academically stupid which led to being sucky at everything in life. And I fundamentally at my core believed it until a bunch of really awesome teachers in Canada started to say all the things about me. And then I went through this confused phase of like, well, who do I believe? Like everybody's older than me and wiser and more established. 
So who the hell do I believe? And, and similar to you, I said, you know, if I can't figure out what I'm good at, I'm going to blindly believe your opinion of me. And the opinion made me feel better. It wasn't somebody saying you're worse than what you were. So when they're empowering you, let's not fight it. Let's not question it. Okay, I am a butter, social butterfly. I am charismatic. I am blah, blah, blah. And I'll hopefully grow into it. Uh, and then here you are. Um, when I was looking you up, one of the things you guys posted um, is a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. And it says, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. What a powerful, powerful statement. Talk to me about that, man. You know, I think, so had I not connected with Bull Dave at 17, I was on a different path. I could have, and my life could have been completely different than it is now. You know, I was hanging out with people that weren't like the best influences. And, you know, I had people that were kind of making me do questionable things. And then I kind of had a, con a conversation with myself, where is this the life that I see myself living? Like my parents, as with you, Satish, our parents immigrated from another country to give us a better life. And these are, are these the choices that I want to make in order for them to be disappointed in me? So mm. when I started volunteering with Buldev, my weekends became a way to help others. And, you know, being a youth, the youngest person on the board, I think it was really helpful for me when we were going to different high schools, talking to people that were my age, maybe a little bit younger, about empowerment, mm. talking to them about you know, body image, talking to them about intergenerational issues, right? So it was only, you know, helping others, but it was also teaching me so much that, right. you know, as a teenager, it's like, okay, wow, you know, I was learning as I went along. And I, as I said, I'm a lifelong volunteer. And I feel like if, if I'm in a good place in my life, I should never forget where I came from. And wow. giving back to others you know, sometimes my mom said, like, when I was going to school, she'd give me money for food and I'd pack a lunch. And I'd see these two youth, these homeless youth sitting on the side of the street. I'd give them my money and say, here, buy some food. So my mom said, like, every time you come, you know, you always ask for more money. What do you do? Mm. And I said to her, I'm like, she's like, you're giving the money to somebody, aren't you? And I told her and she's like, it's up to you. You'd help the whole world. I said, no, that's not it. I, I know that I'm... I'm in a position where I have the luxury. Some people right. don't, mm. right? So that's been sort of my my mantra. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think, you know, as, as I in my 45 look back, um, it's the thought that counts. It's the thought mm -hmm. that says, I have a little bit more today than I need. So who can benefit from what I have as a surplus? And whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's a hug, the point is we become conscious that we have a little bit more than what we need. And instead of wasting it, let's give it to somebody else that could benefit from it. It's such a powerful statement. And so much of like what I love, what you do and why I want to have this conversation is starting to think about that mindset. Because for me, that, that, that unknew that decides, hey, I don't want to go down this path, consciously give up my weekends and mm -hmm. think about certain things is like your version 2.0, starting to yes. find your voice, right? Getting some clarity around like uh, making different choices. But where are you finding the strength to cut ties from folks that were your norm? You know, that was your crew. Mm -hmm. Now you're like, man, I gotta move away, but I can't bring them along. I can't bring them along. Or did you? I didn't, but it, life is full circle. Um, so there's different times of my life throughout after I cut off these group of people that they would show up and I would acknowledge them because anybody that knows me, it's really hard for me not to be nice. So I, I would acknowledge them, but kind of wish them well and not really engage in things because you know, the, the more you work on yourself, I always talk about you elevate yourself to a higher level and a higher vibration. Some people that are still st stuck in that place are going to bring you down. Right. And I don't want that, those kind of vibes. So, you know, it's interesting now, full circle, 20 something years later, um, because I'm, you know, live in Scarborough and work in Brampton, I've been running into these people. And, you know, to see that they're still kind of stuck in their life, I'm getting to a point where I said, listen, hey, 
I'm working with PCHS Foundation. Mm. If you need something, you want some help, this is this is what we can do. We can help you out, right? Yeah. So I, I feel like that's kind of been my my sort of way of like someone helped me. Right. So let me kind of give it back. That's amazing. Um, to stay on this a little bit more, and the reason I'm, I'm going down this path is, you know, I've been co having conversations with young folks where they have this, you know, ride or die YOLO mindset. You know, that's my peeps. I can't leave them. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm trying to find a way to break through to go, hey, uh, you are the sum of the five people you hang out with the most. And that's mm -hmm. truth. It's been proven scientifically. Uh, and, and so if that is the truth and we, ex we have to accept the truth from what Brad said yesterday, um, then you have to find the courage to cut ties and hope there's a value proposition later. But so much of this ride or die loyalty weight hangs on to these toxic relationships. Um, let's talk about maybe in the context of a coaching which I want to get down to, how, how do you talk about, you know, the idea of letting go? So, you know, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about coaching. And, you know, Satish, I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. So mm, okay. it, I might ask you to repeat, it's, it's my phone, not yours. Um, if you can repeat the first part of that, because I heard about the co coaching, but the, the ride or die mentality. Yeah, so, 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 so there's this, there's this notion that, the people we grow up with, the people that are our first friends, no matter how toxic they are, they're our ride or die homies. They're our foundational support. And if, if we are the sum of the five people we constantly surround ourselves with, and those folks are no longer the best five, we can't leave when we're tied to this mindset of loyalty. Right. You know, and, and I was like that. My sister is going through that where there's this historical relationships that no longer are valuable, but there's this, this emotional attachment to homies and we grew up together. This is us, ride or die. Yes. So I think, Satish, the, the older we get, the more we start, like, I, I you know, I'm going to be throwing out all these one-liners, but I read a poem about reason, season, or lifetime. So people come into your life for a reason. Mm. They fulfill that reason, they leave, right? And then there's people that come into your life for a season. They teach you valuable lessons during that season. Then there's the people that will be in your life for a lifetime. So I feel that those ride or dies came into, came into my life. They taught me whatever I needed to learn. But the people that are actually my ride or dies that are still in my life some, from since back in the day, they've gone down the path, the same path that I've gone to and gone mm, through. So right. I feel like those ones are my ride or dies since day one, but we brought each other up. Right. I love that reason, season, lifetime. Mm -hmm. You should check way. out. It's a great poem. Great poem. Wow. Reason, season, lifetime. And I think we, we, we try to put everybody into the lifetime bucket. Mm-hmm. And just hold on to them saying, this is lifetime, 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 where there's some really awesome truth and knowing, hey, it's cool. We're here together for a reason. And that's awesome. And if it turns into anything more, great. If it doesn't, that's cool too. You know? Yes. Um, where does coaching fall into place? Your plate's already full with serving the world. And then you're like, okay, what, what's my level up? I want to become an empowerment coach. Walk me, walk me through that. So I'd say probably about four years ago, um, where I was working before, I went to this leadership training. It was a year-long training. And I, every single person that went through this training was assigned a coach. And so my coach, you know, we had specific goals, et cetera. And I had her for a year. Towards the end of the year, she had said to me, you know, Anu, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but I think you'd be a great coach. And she kind of put me in contact with some people and um, I started to do a little bit more research and, you know, where I worked before, there was not a lot of people that looked like me. Mm. So I had been asked by my coach to come and facilitate um, an organizational equity and inclusion workshop with the Asian caucus. 
of workers. And she said, because of the coaching, she knew that I had skills to do this. So, you know, once I did that group, I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. I've never done something like this before. Let me tap into this. And years passed and then COVID happened. Mm. And, you know, an, uh, here's another one liner where I saw something about if we can't go outside, go inside. <laughs> Say yes. It again. Say it again. Yes. So when I saw that, I thought, okay, what is it in my life that I haven't had the time to do that I know would serve a purpose for me? Mm. If you so, can't go outside, go inside. Go inside. Session over. We're done. We're done. And I it's mean, done. We, Drop the it. mic. <laughs> wow. That's so powerful, man, on what's going on in life right now. This is crazy. I love that statement. Yes. So what I did was, um, I, I believe things happen for a reason. So I had to go to a meeting and I ran into this woman who's going to help me plan a fundraiser and she gave me her business card and it said life coach on it. And I looked at her, I said, I need to talk to you. And she said, listen, here we go this i'm going to introduce you to some people and here's here's a place where you can get certified so mm. i started in may it was a 12 week course i graduated last week and yeah thank you thank you and Congratulations. so so now i'm i'm looking at making that a part of you're right i have a lot on my plate but i'm the the kind of person that works best when i have a lot of things going on I know you can relate to that, Satish. Oh, 100%. So, 100%. Look, yes. as, uh, you know, the line that, that really resonates with me is, is what you said, you know, if you can't go outside, go inside. And that's literally what I did. You know, I started uh, on this path of reinventing myself consciously, you know, uh, since the age of 15, I, I've been consciously reinventing my life. And I realize I'm given, you know, not one life, but the opportunity to create as many versions of my life as I want. So why would I stick to one version of my story? And then once I figured out my blueprint to create whatever version of my life I wanted, I've lived nine lives already, like a cat, you know? I'm working on my 10th one. I wanna be a published keynote you know, speaker. I wanna be an author. I wanna be an international influencer opening doors. Fuck, I wanna be mayor. Like that's, that's my 11th life, you know what I mean? Um, and so when I looked at this, it was, it resonated so well because a lot of my plans that were building traction all stopped dead cold when COVID mm -hmm. happened. And I spent so much time building momentum and it all stopped. And I went through this, this mini depression going, I don't know what to do because it mm -hmm. took eight months to build this momentum, build an incubator, build the brand hundred pages into my book. And and I just, without the way you said it, decided, okay, I'm just going to spend the rest of the year being brutally honest and listening to myself. Because for the first time, I have no distraction. I don't have to get up and check my email. Nobody's emailing me. My calendar is goddamn empty, you know, not by choice, because I like to fill it up, but just mm -hmm. the universe. So I was like, all right, let me just go in and listen for the very first time. And the reason I'm sharing this is, it is probably the most scariest exercise I've ever done mm -hmm. because you can't bullshit to yourself for a long period of time. Maybe mm -hmm. for the first week, maybe for the first couple of weeks, maybe you're like, ah, I got this, whatever. But once that, that, that first facade of reality that you create, it starts to break down, you got to deal with some like, like heat. And yes. most of us have no idea how to do it. It's like, you got to go, far enough down the rabbit hole to get to that level, but we don't. And so when I was thinking about what you're doing with coaching uh, and some of the work informally that I've done, the number one challenge I have is people come to me with the symptoms of their causes, looking for coaching advice as a magic pill. It takes a while, like emotional investment from me, probably like you as a coach to get to the cause of the symptom. Yes. And then we get to a potential solution or a series of activities, but they have to accept it first. So, right. Right. You know, it's almost peeling away the layers of an onion, mm. right? To get to the core of what really the issue is, you have to work through and figure out, okay, 
this is not it. This is not it. There it is. Right. Right. But I also feel Satish because of COVID, there's a lot of stuff that people have been carrying, but this is a way to press the reset button. Just like you Mm. said about the emails, right? Like you're starting your, this, this might be the new, the new Satish where this is who I am now. Yeah. These are the priorities. I'm I'm focused. Like, I I'm so gonna vote for you, Mayor. If you need anybody to help on your campaign, yes. I'll have a Bal- huge entourage of people to help come support you. Okay. Bala for balance. Okay. That that's what's happening. <laughs> I love In it. <laughs> 2025, the shiny quarter. Bala for balance. Guys, get ready. Love it's it. gonna be crazy. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Amazing, it's a, it's, amazing. It's, it's, so, Satish, give me a second. I'm going to get headphones just yeah. so I can hear you properly, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a thing. So, uh, anybody that's interested in getting in touch with Anu, uh, sh- she's going to be linked in the description. And one of the reasons I thought, you know, to close the week off with this topic is just that, you know, there's not a lot of people in our community that uh, has a blueprint without the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully not offend anybody, but this like uh, bow down to senior mindset, okay? And some of you know this, you can't reach out to a lot of folks in our, in our culture that are older, wiser, without having to do the hello uncle, hello auntie, please help me out, I'm a young, confused person, I need your guidance, and hello beta, hello what's up, you know? Um, and that's one of the things I really hated about our community, uh, which is one of the reasons I never really reached out. I was just telling them about like, it's so hard to ask for help in our community, right? Uh, there's very few of us that will listen for listening. You know, I remember when I first started my company, you know, I joined Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce and all these other like South Asian focused communities because I needed to see representation. I come from a family where they hate entrepreneurship for, for historical reasons or whatever. So I'm like, if I can't see somebody doing what I'm doing, how do I get inspired to do it? So mm-hmm. I, I went looking for help, but so much of it turned into like this, this need to be a daddy figure. Okay, but you come, you know, hello, uncle, like I need help. I'm like, no, I have a dad. I have uncle. I don't need a father <laughs> figure. I need somebody to help me understand what the hell's going on from a business strategy door opening. And, and I feel like it's still a challenge. And so, you know, talk to me a little bit about the work you guys do, uh, some of the key services you offer the community. And, and and how do people find the confidence to make that call, man? Like, it's such a big, huge step. And I don't think as a culture, we've made it welcoming enough. We haven't. And I'll, I'll kind of put this into context. So when I graduated from school, I was a social worker. And I had people coming in as clients, and they would say that they needed help to find a job. Right? Mm. So if you look at our community, you're right. Asking for help is very taboo. Right? Asking to help find a job, oh, absolutely, that's acceptable. Mm. So I had people coming in saying that they needed to help, need a job, but that wasn't the issue on why they were coming in. There was mental health issues, there was domestic violence issues, et cetera, right? So they're also, it's a way, if you think about it, they are filtering. First, they're making a call. Okay, who is the person who's answering the phone on the other end? Mm. Does this person know me? Is this person going to go tell their chachas, masis, whatever, that, hey, by the way, so-and-so called, they're asking for help, right? right? So there's that mistrust. So by the time they come into a social worker's office, they're gauging you. Mm. Can I trust this person, right? So I think it's almost like things since the, since the 90s up until now, I feel we've done a lot of work around this. Um, you know, there's going to be there's going to be some people that – like to talk about clients, but, you know, I feel like now it's becoming more and more comfortable. There's different right. forms. And now you look, a lot of organizations have gone to online counseling because of COVID. Right, right. So that, that eliminates the whole, like, the intake, like the person calling, would they know me? So that trust level now, I think, is becoming more and more safer. But mm. it's also getting to a point where the organizations are doing a lot more work around that, getting, right. gaining the trust of the community. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> how hard is it for you to um, help without getting hurt? And so much right. of what we want to help 
you need to open up, right? Like for you to help me get through pain, you need to open yourself up to receiving some of my pain to understand what's happening. I, when I was coaching very briefly, didn't know how to, how to handle that coming back. You know, I was like, oh, I'm sad to be, I'm the coach guy. I can, you know, I can sit, you know, because um, my aspiration as a young man was becoming a psychologist until my parents ripped that dream out of, out of life. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no. And I was like, man, you know, I think that's my superpower, talking to people, finding ways to change your mindset. I'm like, no, computer science. And then, you know, fast forward 25 years later, I do a bit of that work without any training. But what I didn't realize is the emotional impact that stays after that person moves on, right? Yes. Uh, how, do, how do you protect yourself? Because you need to make sure you're strong and protected enough to serve more people. Uh, but mm -hmm. we're humans, man. We hear some of these stories. Uh, and I called you the other day with a story. I'm like, hey, somebody's called me. I don't know how to deal with it. Um, how, do, how do we do that? So I think with any person, including yourself, Satish, whether you're a social worker, whether you're someone who connects with people and helps people out, there's a shelf life. So I was a social worker for 12 years. But then I realized that I needed to do something completely different. Mm. Because it's, it's physically and mentally exhausting. But if one thing that we learned, what I learned fairly quickly, was when you leave your office, you close the door and you leave that there. Mm. very difficult to do that but it's much must needed and there's also things that i still do up until today you have to remember what's important that feeds your soul right so i love thai food so every friday i would go and treat myself to thai food because it's That's feeding awesome. my soul right <laughs> it's <That's> awesome <laughs> it was so and then also i made sure that i watched a movie <clears throat> once a week because it gave me roughly an hour and a half, not a Hindi movie, English movie, yeah. one and a half hours to two hours <laughs> where I didn't have to talk. Yes, yes, I love right? that, yeah. Yes, so it gave me a chance to kind of reconnect with myself. But also I think, Satish, it's, you know, you have to figure out what your niche is. Like mm. helping the whole world is exhausting. If yes. you know that you can devote X amount of hours in a week to help someone, and still be able to keep yourself in check, I think is important. You just always, even in any career, you have to find the work-life balance. Yeah, you know, it's funny you use the word career because uh, I've always looked at the work you do, people that are in the not-for-profit space, it's not your traditional career, income, revenue thought. And this is a misconception, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, that you can't really go and build a great life if you're servicing others because there's no money mm -hmm. in it there's no it's not a it's not a growth opportunity it's a serve opportunity um but does that hinder people coming into the category that could really help uh and if somebody is afraid of money in this space and the show is making money moves um what does money mean in this industry and like how do you uh, what's your relationship with with money so interesting enough, I um, so when I went into social work, we said that we're the most underpaid and underappreciated. It's the under uh, underpaid, underappreciated sector. But I remember my first paycheck. I couldn't believe I was getting paid for something that I loved to do. Ooh, what a way to reposition it! Okay, yes. okay, Anu. Yes. So I thought to myself, okay, I'm getting paid something that I'd love to do. The older we get, our priorities change. But Satish, I went from being a social worker to working for a union. Mm. Unions got cash, right? So I went and essentially doubled my salary. But I left that. Mm. Because it doesn't matter about the money. It matters about being able to sleep peacefully at night, knowing you're doing something that you love to do. So my life came full circle. Wow. I came back to nonprofit, even if it's in a different capacity, but I'm still doing something that I know I'm making a difference in people's lives. Satish, I do want to share something with you when it comes to one of the programs I talked about that we're funding for PCHS Foundation. So when I came back into the nonprofit sector, Lunger on Wheels, I, I, I said to one of the staff people, listen, I know I'm the CEO of the foundation, but treat me like you treat any other volunteer. 
I want to go and deliver food to the seniors. Right. Satish, that was a, a good reminder for me on why I chose to change my career. Mm. When we were giving food to these seniors and they were just happy to see someone, but we're giving them a basic necessity. Yes. We're feeding wow. them. Wow. Right? We're feeding them. And I remember, like, I'm a hugger, as you know. So, like, I went and they were like, come and sit. Let's talk. Are you going to be coming more often? I said, I, I can tell you I'll come once a month. And I, I do since, since the beginning of the year. I go once a month because it humbles me. As I said mm. before, it reminds me where I started. But to see our elderly in situations like that, you know, I, have, I still have a grandmother. She's 95. And what she's taught me is what I'm going to be teaching for generations to come. Right. So I feel like there's so many, there's so many situations in our lives where we take for granted, but I was able to kind of tap into that because it was readily available to me. So I needed right. to share about the longer on wheels just because it reminded me on why I needed to come back mm. to helping others as a career. No, I love it, man. I love it. So let's let's get a little bit more granular as mm -hmm. a coach now, Coach Anu. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody who's in a state of confusion, life is not feeling right. You can't identify it yet, but somebody just doesn't feel right. And you're trying to figure out, what do I do? You know, what process, what routine, what something can I do to start creating a sense of structure, right? Mm -hmm. um, People have talked about journaling, meditating, so many things. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how would you help? Sure. So interesting enough, I actually ground, I ground my client. First thing I do is I have them ground and I do a breathing exercise with them. Just what does because that mean, ground, the, ground? Like are you grounding. talking about, ah, okay. No, so like, for instance, everyone has their routines. I can tell you what my routine is, but I think we it's We want important. to know your routine, so you got to okay. tell us. So I get up in the morning. Yes. And I do a gratitude journal. Okay. First thing in the morning, do a gratitude journal. List a couple of things that I'm grateful for. Get in the shower and I do a grounding exercise. Because there's people that give so much to others, we have to remember to take care of ourselves first. Mm. So grounding, you think about yourself as like a tree. You're setting up your roots. And what I say is set up my roots where I am so I can give light and love in my heart so I can give light and love to others. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> this that. is how I start my day. This is how I start wow. my days. So with my, my coaching clients, I get them to do a breathing exercise right at the beginning, whatever they're carrying, whatever stress before the call, we're going to get them to remember that where we are right now in the present. Wow. What I, yes. What I get them to also do is I've at the beginning of our session, first session, I ask them to list 10 items in their lives that they want to change and rate them from one to 10. The top three is what we work on. Mm. Right. And you know, usually coaching can get, go anywhere from like three months to six months. So within the three months, we're going to work on those. But what I find is really important is a lot of people, excuse my language, they're carrying other people's shit, not their mm. shit. Say right? that again, Anu, man. That's a sound bite. Say it again, yes. man. So people are carrying other people's shit. It's not their shit to carry. So it's, it's a reminder for them to realize, okay, you know what? I need to figure out what is my stuff and let me work mm -hmm. through my stuff. You have to get to a point where it's like, okay, you know what? Honestly, this is uh, the, the things that I need to work on. Put the other stuff back on other people. Wow. Because the more we realize, the more stuff, we're, the stresses that we're taking on, it's not ours. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for those of us that are watching this and listening to it later, you know, other people's shit could also include your, your, your parents' pressure mm -hmm. on you, your siblings' pressure on you, your, your life partner's pressure on you. It's like, like you know, I had, I had a realization as my daughter's turning, you know, 13 this weekend, right? <sighs> And I'm, and I'm like carrying all this weight of trying to be this father because when my sister turned 13 is when I moved out and she went down some interesting paths to discover herself. But I've been carrying this weight of like, man, I messed up once. 
when my sister was 13 to 15, where I should have been there as his big brother to guide her, what's going to happen? Oh my, and I was carrying all this weight. And then something happened yesterday. We were in the office. We we're just chilling. We we're having a good time. And, and I was like, you know, she's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And I can't carry the weight of her life. I can only be there to help and support. And I, and I slept pretty good last night for the first time this week. Good, but it's her journey, right? right? Like you're carrying the stress, but there's lessons that all of us have to go through. But it's, you know, whether people believe in destiny or whatever, but this is, these are, this is the path that your daughter, I can't believe she's 13. I remember when she was born. Crazy. Wow, it's crazy. <laughs> but like the, the path that people are supposed to take, the lessons that they're learning on that path, are, are, mm. are going to help define who they are. Man. So mm-hmm. let's talk about this project you're working on, International Students. Yes. Uh, I'm glad you told me about it, and I want the entire world to hear about it. S- start from zero. Let's work into what you're doing, and then how can everybody help? Sure. So roughly about three years ago, um, at one of our board meetings for PCHS, Bill Dave had brought up the fact that there's issues that are happening with international students. And... Um, the more we delved into what these issues were, the more I felt, um, how is the community not doing anything about this? So the first issue is roughly every month, I want that to sink in, every month there's three to five international students that are killing themselves. And not just here in Ontario, but across the country. Wow. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's sad, it's heartbreaking because... I found out about this in 2017. How long have international students been coming here? Mm. And how long has this been going on for? So that was the first, the first issue that came up. The second is around human trafficking and sex trafficking. And what I realized is in Brampton, there's four shopping malls that these young women are getting pimped out. And they're getting wow. pimped out by Desi guys. So, you know, a lot of our community likes to point the finger at other people. Oh, yeah, yeah, this community, it's not ours. Our own people are taking advantage of our own. Jeez. And these, these girls are getting pimped out and they're forced into this. Their passports are getting taken. They're falling in love with these guys thinking, oh, I have a boyfriend. They're taking their passports, threatening them, saying, if you say anything, we're not giving you your passport back. And we're going to call your parents back in India and tell them the work that you're doing. So, you know, the more I started to unpack and figure out all these issues that are happening, I was like, we need to do something. So, yeah. So about a year, a year or so ago, myself and two other people, we started an organization called Suno. And what we did is we've, we want to create a network. And we know I've, I've done tons of focus groups with international students, what their top needs are. So we've partnered with employment agencies we have lawyers that we're working with. We have uh, doctors, right? We've made a list of a network for these students to be connected with. What our plan is almost threefold. So I partnered with the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce, fantastic organization. Um, what they do is they partner with their different chapters and to give back to the community. Mm. So they have branches all across India. So this is not just a Punjabi issue. This is an Indian Indian international student issue so what's happening is they have different chapters we're creating a webinar because what's happening is these students and their parents before they come here we want to show them the reality Mm. right because their expectation is our kid comes to the airport here at Pearson or whatever airport and a relative's picking them up guess what the relatives don't come pick them up they're in a new country yeah don't speak the language or if they do it's new surrounding that's a culture so shock. It is. So what we want to do is say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we're going to do to support them. But we're going to help with that network. I've trained uh, a bunch of peer mentors that are actually international students themselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the colleges. So during orientation week, we're going to help these students. We're going to give them a phone number. Within the first week, you need help. You're depressed. You need a job. You need this. Here's a number someone will be able to answer this call 24 seven. And yeah, so these students are going to be almost like the first point of contact. They'll figure out 
what is it that the issues that these students are having and then we're partnering with PCHS to be able to to provide mental health and addictions counseling but my goal and I know our goal the team's goal is to prevent more suicides from happening like it yeah. just breaks my heart every day I'm hearing about more and more students that are passing one of the partners of our organization he's the owner of Lotus Funeral Home and he gets every time I'm there he gets phone calls that someone's passed right wow. and, and it's, who's calling him is it is it the city is it like who calls when an international student doesn't have roots, passes away to a funeral home? So what's happening is usually it's the friend or it's the Indian consulate general's office wow. saying, right. And you know, it's like, I'll, I'll give an example. I got a phone call from one of our staff at PCHS saying that there was someone that they were trying to connect with in Montreal. They didn't get hold of him for quite some time they got a phone call that he jumped off a bridge and drowned. Wow. I called Lotus Funeral Home and said, listen, we need your help. Satish, within two and a half hours, their staff person was already driving to Montreal, got the body released, brought it back, and had it shipped to India. So before COVID, they've gotten it to the point where they bring the body, release the body, ship it to the village within, within three days. Wow. I mean... I'm so happy to hear them respond, but I hate the fact that this is even a service that they need to be good at. I know it is sad. You and know? you know, and like you were talking to me and like we all do work that's heavy. My heart goes out to the staff that is dealing with this on mm. a regular basis, right? Like I'm hearing about it and it's breaking my heart. They're experiencing this. Right. So, so what Sano, what we're planning to do is we're fairly new. And I, I, first and foremost, what I've been doing, and I might get a lot of flack from the community for this, but I've been calling people out on their shit. So WhatsApp videos, other media outlets, what they're doing is they're showing all the bad stuff that the international students are doing. Oh, you know what? They are like making so much dirt, like they're making such a mess in people's houses. They're driving fast cars. They're doing this. But you know what? I, uh, the, the last interview I said, a lot of people that weren't born here that immigrated here, maybe it's actually, it's, it's a reality check. And maybe you need to actually look back when you first came here, how mm. much of a struggle it was. But guess, guess what? You weren't 17 or 18 with the world's weight on your shoulders. Yeah. Put yourself in their shoes and figure out what kind of struggles that they're going through. So we're, yeah. we're, I want to build awareness with the community first and foremost. But what we're doing, like I said, we're developing a network. And we want these students to know that they're not here by themselves. Listen, you get the entire Desi Fest Nation behind you now. Mm -hmm. uh, I made that up. I think I have a Desi Fest Nation, but if we'll make it happen, you know, if they're gonna log in every day to listen to some Bollywood music, they can log in every day to help and support. Um, man, I, I the 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 fact that it's happened so long, and and you championing in 2017. And, and, and the blind eye, consciously or unconsciously, uh, that, that we turned away is mind-blowing to me. And when we preach the future is the next generation. Like, I'm 45. I'm going to make least amount of impact possible going forward uh, versus the next generation. They're going to change our economics, our culture, our, our opportunities, our innovation. And, and it's one thing to, to be sad and depressed and like not have option to reach out and get help, but to get to the ultimate mindset of I have to take my life. Wow. You know, I can't even imagine what that thought pattern is that put a person into that mindset, you know? So we're here to help whatever we could do and they see Fest Nation could do. We are Thank here you. to help. Um, getting back into you and finishing up this call. We have a few more minutes. Um, what's the roadmap like for you? You know, as you're looking at, you know, I, we talked about finding the voice. I feel like you've got a very clear idea of what your voice is like. Mm -hmm. You've got some clarity that, that you know, uh, um, is giving you the, the strength, the superpower to take on some of these big challenges. Um, what are you working on now? You know, when you're looking at like, where's a new 3.0? What are the <laughs> things that you want to you wanna work on? You know, what does self-growth look like for you? You know, I feel like, 
there's always going to be a new cause. Like, so, you know, there's always things that are close to my heart, but to eventually not just help the international students from India, but there's international students coming from all over the world. Right. So my goal is to connect with the Chinese community, to connect with the Latin community, to connect with all the Filipino community, all, everyone to say, hey, listen, this is what we've come across. Mm. We want to make sure that this is, if this is happening in your community, let's figure out how to partner together. So that's one thing I see happening. The second is my life coaching. I feel like I empower people anyways. So to like make this into a, another career, I feel like, you know, you and I had a conversation yesterday that I, I said, my motto has been ever since I can remember, everybody has a story to tell. They just need someone to listen. So I feel like to continue that in any capacity. A new 3.0, you know what? I'll be your campaign manager when you become a mayor. Yes. There we go. Prime listen. Minister, why stop a mayor? Go to Prime Minister. Come on now. <laughs> listen, okay. I do have a picture with Justin, which I can use in my, in my, in my, in my you know, I, I think it's the, it, what I love about your story and what I'm hoping people can get from this money talks, morning conversations. And I, and I called it making money moves because that's the one thing we all think about that you can't control. And it becomes such a heavy part of everybody's consciousness, money, money, money. And I wanted to deconstruct that fear. And then, and then, like you said, you know, it's not about making money. It's about how do I feel when I make that money? Mm -hmm. And it's such yes. a boss line. Like that's a t-shirt. <laughs> I knew that's a t-shirt that has to be made and handed out to a bunch of people. Um, of all the things that you're, you're, you're doing, uh, what's the one milestone as of today that you're super proud of? Wow. Other than reconnecting with me after five or 10 I know, years right? I'm not hanging uh, out. <laughs> my milestone. I would say that, um, you know, Satish, okay, I, I'll tell you my milestone, but one thing I find <laughs> always interesting, anytime Desi Fest happens, I always end up on stage dancing. Okay, so it's like, everyone's like, hey, where's Anu? Oh, she will probably find her up on stage dancing. So I have to say that. Anyways, um, my milestone. I feel like, you know, my journey has not been an easy one. And I feel like I got a second lease on life. Wow. April 1st, 2009 was when my life changed. Mm. And I, on that day, I made it a point to make, to define my life the way I wanted it to. So my milestone was starting fresh and defining what I wanted. And now fast forward to what's today's the 21st yeah, of August, I 2020. So. Wow. My life, had I looked, have I had a conversation with Anu from April 1st, 2009 to now, I'd be so impressed of what I've done, my journey and where I'm going to go. You know, I'm happily married, live back, came back to Scarborough. My journey has been all across North America. So I'm glad to be back home and super happy from the people that I've met, such as yourself and everybody on my journey. And I've learned from everyone. And if there's one last thing I can tell you, milestone that st is in my heart I was a youth worker in Parkdale and I was asked to do an International Women's Day event. So all immigrant young women, I asked them to name one woman in their life that's made a difference. Mm -hmm. And whether they were here or not, we, I made them a certificate, gave them their certificate and said, okay, make it, tell us why you're giving this award to whom. But then what I did was I gave each and every single one of them a certificate from me. Oh, because wow. they all changed my life. And, yeah. you know, they didn't realize the impact that they had on me. And I don't know if anyone had ever appreciated what their worth was. So that, that is, that is one. Yeah. Listen, oh, I get teary I don't even know what I'm talking about. It. Listen, the, 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 the CEO version of you is so on point. The coach Anu is so on point. I'm so happy that you shared that milestone and, and, and the ability to, to build that life. And I love when, when people are making choices that come from a position of chasing happiness 
chasing fulfillment and chasing, you know, the serving of others. Um, and I'm, and with these morning talks, I'm starting to connect the dots on how I think about myself. And I see so much of what you're doing uh, in small pieces and what I'm trying to do. And you've given me terminology and roadmap and path to sort of start thinking, ah, this is what I'm trying to do and why I'm trying to do the things I'm trying to do. And I had no idea you watch movies by yourself. I do that too, you know? <laughs> uh, that, that's the only rule. If you ever catch me in the movie theater at one o'clock, don't say hi. Just know that I'm there alone, chilling out with my popcorn. That's right. And I'll say you say hi to you later. But thank you so much for your time, Anu. This has been so thank amazing. You. I'm I'm glad we reconnected. And like I said, Daisy Fest Nation has got your back. Let's let's get into into you know your your program and anything we can do to help. We're here to help. Satish, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Much appreciated. Cool, man. Okay, enjoy the Friday. See you soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.